Good evening to you all. I hope you can all hear me all right and that we are going to have a, a good evening. Um, wherever you are in the world, it's good evening and welcome to the British Interplanetary Society's eighth live streamed Q&A session. Yes, and I've been in self-imposed lockdown for all those eight months. But even more important today is the fact that is today is the 87th anniversary of the BIS, founded in Liverpool in 1933. So we have something to celebrate as well. Uh, I must apologize for the complete failure to live stream the Q&A last Wednesday. Though we checked out the system at the weekend and did a test run on Monday, we think YouTube changed the software in their control panel, which didn't match ours. I hope we have a trouble-free session tonight. For those who don't know me, I'm Alistair Scott, a past president of the British Interplanetary Society, and I now chair the events committee and try to coordinate all our activities. As most of you will be fully aware, last week was World Space Week, and this year's theme is satellites. I thought, what better way for the BIS to celebrate man's use of satellites than to look at one of the most complex and sophisticated scientific exploration satellites, ESA's Solar Orbiter, which was built here in the UK. And who better to tell us all about it than the project manager, Ian Walters. But as Ian has reminded me, when we first discussed his talk, Solar Orbiter is actually not a satellite, it's a spacecraft, as it doesn't orbit a planet. It orbits a star. Anyway, I hope you've all had the chance to watch Ian's fascinating talk. I'm pleased to have Ian with us tonight to answer your questions. As you will have seen on the video, Ian has been at the forefront of the space industry since leaving university. He joined British Aerospace Space Systems in 1982, and when I joined the Space Division from BAE headquarters in 1984, Ian was already well established and working with the Future Project Projects Group on HOTOL, BAE's uh, air breathing space plane. He then went on to interesting things on communication satellites. And then when I disappeared off to the Far East and Australasia, he went on to do, first of all, Galileo, uh, the navigation satellites and then came back to work on interesting programs like Rosetta and the uh, MIRI instrument for the James Webb Space Telescope. So he's had tremendous experience in a variety of different areas of the space community, and we look forward to hearing his response to the questions today. We already have a number of questions, but if you have any more, please email them to me as soon as possible on streaming at bis-space.com. Right, well, I'm going to actually ask a few questions first to actually get Ian ready. I can see he's all ready for them. I'm going to ask the first question, and then he can introduce himself at the same time. I just have to find it. One second. I know it's here somewhere. Right, the first question is from Mike Lawford in Harpenden. And he says he's fascinated to hear about Ian and what a tremendous undertaking it is to get such a spacecraft ready to fly. He says, I'm not technically experienced, but I do work in projects, albeit not so exciting financial services ones. So I'd like to know more about what Ian's role as the project manager entails over the whole lifetime of the approval, design, build, test and operation of the spacecraft. At what point in that timeline did he get appointed and with what expectation of how long he would be involved? How much of his day job is taken up with the project during each phase, especially given it must be a few decades in total? Well, there's a question for you, Ian. Over to you, Ian. All right, thank you very much, Alistair. So first of all, uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to answer some of the questions that you've got for me. Hope you enjoyed the presentation we put out a couple of weeks ago. And so I'm Ian Walters. Um, I've been, as Alistair said, in the space industry for 38 years now, and I've worked on a lot of interesting projects. 
probably Solar Orbiter turned out to be the most interesting project of all that I've worked on. So that's really great. You know, I'm at the end of my career. I still managed to work on something which is fantastically interesting, really complicated. It's nice to get your, your mind around something so, so challenging and difficult uh, when you get to the end of your career like me. Um, so I've been involved in Solar Orbiter since September 2015. I think that was one of uh, Mike's questions. Um, I joined more or less halfway through the project. It was around the time of critical design review, so just coming to the end of the detailed design stage. And um, it was around the time as well when the subcontractors were starting to deliver hardware and we were just preparing to start integrating the very first unit on the very first mm -hmm. panel in the clean room at Stevenage. So that, that's when I joined. Uh, and I joined with the expectation it would probably be about um, four years before launch. And in fact, it was more or less four years from then or four and a bit years to go to the launch. So we're very pleased that um, we managed to deliver that spacecraft quite quickly. I mean, it might sound a long time for some people. It might sound ridiculously fast for others. I mean, it actually was about nine years from the contract signature of the main contract phase, which was in July 2011. And we launched in February 2020, so it's just about nine years. And that's about as fast as you can really design something that's really as complicated as Solar Orbit. It's the first time we've done anything that complicated in Stephen. It's the first time that we've built a spacecraft with 10 instruments, we built a couple of spacecraft, complicated spacecraft, but with one instrument, like Lisa Pathfinder, for instance. Um, but the first time where we've had to integrate all these multiple instruments with conflicting needs and requirements, which I've tried to explain a bit in the presentation, and I think maybe there's a question later on that. Um, so another question was, um, what do I do in my day-to-day -day job? Does it fill all my time? You bet it does. <laughs> <laughs> it's really a full-time job by full-time i mean 70 hours a week 80 hours a week sometimes um it's you know it's a really demanding thing for spacecraft especially when you need to launch on a fixed launch date um, we are quite lucky that we do have one or two launch dates we could go on but it turned out that february 2020 was the prime launch slot for a number of reasons um, I'll maybe come on to those later. I think one of the questions is about that. Um, but it, it was something we really had to try and meet. So we really pulled out all the stops and that required us to work really, really hard. Um, what's it like managing a team of that size? It's quite a big team. So it did reach a peak of about 230 people in Stevenage, which is probably the biggest team that's been assembled there for any project. Uh, and overall, across all of the 91 subcontractors, it's probably something like about 2,000 people overall. So really quite a, a huge undertaking uh, to do. Um, but very interesting, very challenging. Um, how do we project manage something so big and so complicated? It comes down to a great team. It's as simple as that. If you've got a great team, you can do great things. If you haven't put together a great team, you can't do anything. So really the key is at the beginning is to get your team together um, focused on one goal. So communication is a big topic when your team is so large, it has to be communicated at every level. You all have to be aligned to the same goals uh, and that's a constantly updated process. So communication is a really big part of my job, um, but much less so decision-making because the team is empowered. They make decisions at their own levels and, and that works really, really well very happy that the team that I've got is, is really empowered and able to take decisions on a day-to-day -day basis with more or less no involvement from me. So my job, if I can use maybe a, a sailing analogy, my, my job is really you know, sometimes to be navigating the ship, you know, still with a steering wheel, sometimes to be up in the crow's yeah. nest looking over the horizon, seeing what's coming next, and from time to time getting down to the engine room, rolling my sleeves up and uh, shoveling coal along with everybody else. Um, so it's, it's it's a really great mix of jobs as a project manager uh, when you've got a great team. So I hope that answered the first question, Alistair. Right. Well, let's hope that uh, that gave the answers. I you were actually working with an international team, so you were how many countries were involved? Oh, I never I never counted how many countries. Certainly, we've got something like eleven European countries, um, including uh, things like Greece. Um, we've certainly got the US involved, you know, for, for key components. 
Japan was involved with the uh, carbon fiber that we make the uh, heat shield carbon fiber panels out of. So it's it's quite an international undertaking. I would say maybe 15 to 20 countries, but I never count. Right. Right. Well, let's move on to the next question, which is um, a bit more um, practical or technical. Uh, from Alan Marlowe in Milton Keynes, he says, what velocity will sol solar orbiter be traveling at when it's at its A, aphelion, and B, perihelion? Okay, so for everybody who might not know, but I'm, I guess most of you will know, uh, we talk about aphelion and perihelion when we're going around the sun. So aphelion is the furthest point from the sun and perihelion is the closest point from the sun. Um, I'm, I'm actually feeling on comfortable ground when we talk about mission design because that's what I started on in my career. I did physics at university and then went straight into mission analysis at, at uh, British Aerospace. So it's, it's really quite nice to have a mission analysis question to start with. Um, yeah, so right now we're in an elliptical orbit. Um, the aphelion, the furthest point from the sun, is more or less at the Earth's orbit. It's, it's the injection orbit that we injected into eight months ago. So we're more or less at the altitude right now. We've done one complete orbit more or less a few days ago. Um, <clears throat> the altitude of the, where the Earth was uh, eight months ago. So 0.99 AU uh, in February when we launched. Um, and at that altitude, we're doing about 24 kilometers a second. Now the Earth is doing 30 kilometers a second. So when we injected, we actually slowed down with respect to the Earth. We're going slower than the Earth right now. Um, but when we get to perihelion, when we get the closest point, that's about 0.51 AU in the current orbit, about half the distance to the sun. And then the speed is about 47, 47 and a half kilometers a second. So that's significantly faster than what we're doing right now. It's faster than uh, the speed of Mercury in its orbit. But that's in the current orbit. And we're going to get closer and closer to the sun. As we do so, we speed up more and more as we get to perihelion. So actually, when we get to about 0.28 AU, which we'll get to uh, in about 2023, 2024, um, we'll speed up to about 70 kilometers a second. So if people want to put that into perspective in terms of Earth units, that's about Mach 200. So we think that's the, probably the fastest um, craft that uh, has ever been launched by Europe. We've got the speed record with you. Right, well, thank you. I think... Um... We'll, we'll stick with that one. A lot of records happening. Our birthday at the same time as your highest speeds. Uh, right, let me look at the next question. I keep losing them. Every time I come back on, they disappear. Right, the next question actually is again from Alan Marlow, Milton Keynes. And he says, the James Webb Space Telescope uses multiple layers of reflective material to cool the infrared sensors. Would a system like that have worked instead of the solid heat shield that Solar Orbiter uses? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, to know how JWST was designed because I did work on the mid infrared instrument, which as you're aware was delivered in 2012, but we're still waiting for a ride into space uh, as the James Webb Space Telescope still isn't gonna go up until I think October 21, um, which is unfortunate, but um, there you go. That's, that's space technology for you. Um, so actually, it turns out that we have designed a heat shield that is extremely similar to the design principles that James Webb Space Telescope uses. Our heat shield isn't actually solid. It's not like an ablative heat shield or anything. It's actually composed of multiple layers of titanium foil. So the outer layer is basically 20 layers of titanium foil each between 10 to 50 microns. The outer skin is covered in the solar black material I discussed in the presentation. But apart from that, it's just pure titanium foil. The inner layers are what we call dimpled, so they're, they're raised in little spots. And the reason for that is to separate the layers um, so that they don't contact each other over large areas. Um, and that reduces the amount of conduction that you get between the layers. We want it to be purely ready to transfer. And so between the layers of foils, these 20 layers of foils, you've got basically 19 gaps in which all of the heat energy, the infrared photons are going to scatter, reflect about, and hopefully the vast majority will emerge out of the sides of the foils and not propagate through, uh, propagate the heat uh, energy through to the next level layer of foils. So actually our 20 layers of foils look a lot like the James Webb Space Telescope design. Uh, obviously it's a completely different temperature, but the principle is the same. We're trying to scatter the heat energy out of the sides of the spacecraft. And then behind that first layer, 
uh, we've got this big vacuum gap, 15 centimeter gap before we get to the inner layer. And by the time we get to the inner layer, we're already down to below 300 degrees centigrade. So we can use standard MLI technology for that. So that's made of materials like Upalex and VDA Kapton, which are more plastic materials um, or standard. So the principle is the same as James Webb Space Telescope, but it doesn't look like it. Um, I would say it probably doesn't look like it because um, James Webb Space Telescope heat shield is deployed. It has to be deployed because it's enormous and fit in the rocket. Whereas uh, we try to minimize the number of deployables on the spacecraft because each one is a single point failure. I think a red James Webb Space Telescope has got some fantastic number, like 80 deployments or something unbelievable. Um, so we've done all our deployments. We only had about five, fortunately, and they were done in a few hours after launch. So um, the heat shield is not deployed, it's just mounted, fixed, and because it's mounted in its flight configuration at launch, it has to survive the launch, obviously, uh, and, and that's why it looks, I would say, quite chunky and solid, but it's not really solid, it's just multiple foils. Um, and incidentally, it, it just fits in the fairing, and that's by design. We designed the heat shield to exactly fit inside the fairing, so we made it as big as possible, the clearance is just a few millimeters at each corner. Uh, and the spacecraft is then designed entirely around that heat shield size. So the fairing determines the heat shield size and then the heat shield size determines the spacecraft size. So everything is, is designed from that. Right, well, thank you. I'm just trying to get myself back up and running again. Um, yes, we've got the next question lined up. Again, it's from, ah, surprise, surprise. It's again from Alan Marlowe. And he says, is Solar Orbiter at an increased risk of being hit and seriously damaged by solar flares or coronal mass ejections because of its proximity to the sun? Um, yes, uh, it is uh, more at risk probably than a spacecraft that's um, around the location of the Earth. But you know, every spacecraft mission has its own environment considerations to take into account. Um, so Bepi Colombo, for instance, um, is also going to a similar distance, not quite as close to the sun as we are, but at the distance of Mercury, which is about 0.4 AU. Um, so they've got the sun's environment, more or less the same as we have, but they've also got the environment of Mercury to take into account, um, which is shining, of course, not from the direction of the sun, but can be from the other side some of the time. So they've got a difficult thermal environment that we don't really have. You no, know, we, we've got all of our heat coming from the front and we shield from that. So actually it's quite straightforward for us. Um, programs like JUICE, uh, they've got the very challenging environment of Jupiter to take into account all the different particle uh, and magnetic field environment. Mm -hmm. Jupiter is very severe. Uh, and Rosetta, of course, is another example, um, although it's very cold. We didn't have to worry about temperature, extreme hot, hot extremes. We didn't have to worry about cold extremes and also the dust environment around a comet traveling at high speeds um, can cause uh, significant damage. So each one's got its own considerations. Um, I would say, yes, the X-ray environment and the particle environment around the sun is significantly higher, but, but I don't know the figures precisely, but let's say a factor of 10 higher than around the Earth. Um, and we've designed for that. So all of the electronic boxes are shield for, shielded for radiation, including some of the critical components inside the boxes. We've got uh, software that copes with single event upsets caused by uh, charged particles hitting key components inside the CPUs. We can cope with that. We've got uh, fully redundant units across the spacecraft. So if a unit does happen to be damaged, we switch immediately to the other side. And we've got a very uh, deep and complex fault detection, isolation and recovery system, which I hinted at in the presentation. Um, which, you know, should the worst happen and we get a kind of cascade of failures, it really can take care of many, many different failure cases and recover from that. So in general, with the design for what we think we know, we don't actually know the environment around the sun that well. We have been there many times, so we don't really know. Um, but we've designed for the worst case that we think will happen. Um, and um, of course, something worse could happen than the worst case we designed for but um, I'm, I'm pretty sure Solar Orbiter will survive it. Right, well, thank you for that one. Um, now, the next question actually comes from Les Shoulder, who's a 
well, I keep saying he's still on the, the London-Essex border. And I'm going to ask it in two halves. Um, was the mission planned from the beginning to cover an entire solar cycle? Or was that just fortunate happenstance? Yeah, so I think that was fortunate happenstance, uh, almost. So the idea was actually to follow the solar cycle from a, a solar minimum to a solar maximum. Um, we really wanted to see that activity build and try to understand it with the instrument we've got. Um, so that was one of the reasons we wanted to launch in 2020 because that was close to the solar minimum. So we can see that build now over the next four or five years. Um, it, it looks like we're going to be able to go on to the end of the mission for 10 years. It's, it's not only a, a technical issue, but um, also a funding issue. So he says funding mechanisms have to fund the final stages of the mission, uh, which they've not, not yet committed to. Uh, but the spacecraft itself has got enough fuel for 10 years. It's designed for 10 years. It could probably go on for significantly longer than that if it can be funded. Um, so it looks like we're going to be able to cover the whole solar cycle, which would be absolutely great. It was a lot of a lot of data of that whole cycle. So uh, yeah, kind of happenstance really. Right. Well, let's ask the second half. And what he says here, he says, um, with the time scale taken of the mission from idea to delivery, and given the possible serious outcome of another Carrington event on the Earth. If the hope for scientific returns regarding the ability to forecast when coronal mass ejections or solar storms are likely to occur are found, it would be very irresponsible to leave the Earth without cover. So is Solar Orbiter 2 already in preparation to take over in 2030? If not, what would you say is the latest it could be left to start construction to make sure of continuity? That's really interesting because um, because the follow on mission is actually being prepared. So I think so somebody in ESA had already had the foresight to think about um, a follow on program. So, I mean, first of all, it's worth saying Solar Orbiter is not an operational program. Its its job is really the collection of science data um, and, and its job is to collect a, as much data as possible, vast quantities of data, uh, terabytes of data. Um, and and it's it's preferable to wait a couple of months if you can get twice as much data uh, than trying to get all the data back quickly. So we don't have a latency requirement. It's it's nice to get your data back in a week, but if if you have to wait a month or two months, you're going to wait two months if you're going to get all your data back. So it's not an operational system. Um, two months latency for an operational system would be a complete disaster. I don't know what the latency requirements really are, but I would say you know, minutes not months, um, so a solar orbiter isn't one. But but it is flying technology, which we think is good for an operational system. Now, it turns out that uh, ESA decided uh, a while back that they did want an operational system, the follow on from solar orbiter, that mission's called Lagrange. It's called Lagrange because uh, the operational spacecraft will not be flying close to the sun. It turns out that's not really needed for an operational system. It's going to be at the uh, L5 point, um, which is a Lagrange point in the same orbit as the Earth, um, but actually 60 degrees behind the Earth, um, trailing the Earth. And the beauty of being in that position is that you can actually see parts of the sun that have not yet rotated into view from the Earth's point. So I calculated, I hope I'm right. <laughs> I think the sun rotates every 25 days or so. Um, and that, that would mean that um, Lagrange can see parts of the sun for four days or so before um, they can be seen on Earth, which is, which is great because if you see you know, a coronal mass ejection building on the limb of the sun, but it can't yet be seen from Earth, that warning can be sent back to Earth within minutes so that uh, you know, we've basically got a four day warning of that event. We won't know if that coronal mass ejection is going to hit Earth. Uh, until Solar Orbiter is successful and the scientists are successful to understand the model of how the heliosphere works, which I tried to explain in the presentation. I'm not a scientist, um, so I can't explain all the details of that. But it is it is complicated how corona mass ejections travel through the heliosphere because of the magnetic field complexities. Um, 
So we'd still need to have the prediction part, but we also need to have the remote sensing part and the L5 uh, point in the Earth's orbit it turns out to be a great vantage point to, to look at the sun. So that program is already in planning. Um, it's in the preliminary stages of the early design. Uh, the launch date will be 2027, which is perfect because uh, we'll still have solar orbiter up there. Solar orbiter will still be in orbit while Lagrange is just going uh, to its operational station. So I'd say they're perfectly dovetailed one after the other. Um, as well, it turns out that um, all of the instruments that are on Lagrange are derivatives of the same instruments that are flown on Solar Orbiter. So all of the technology that's been developed on Solar Orbiter has been reused again for Lagrange, which I think is also great. Well, it's nice to know we're looking to the future and that we have a future. Um, we, we hope to be out of lockdown by the time they, uh, they launch that one then. Uh, right, we've got another question from Les Shoulder, and he says, with all the effort to make the solar arrays electrostatically neutral and the reaction wheels magnetically invisible, is this the first stealth satellite to be made? Yeah, I think I think that's a valid statement. <laughs> um, it's, it's We always try and, uh, and minimize the effect of the spacecraft on the scientific instruments. The instruments don't want the spacecraft to be there really they they're happy for the ride and and for the power supply and so on but they, they don't really want the spacecraft to be there to interfere with their operation um so we try we try and pretend not to be there basically um but there are other spacecraft that that are designed in a bespoke way to satisfy one instrument so I'll give you some examples cluster and the follow-on mission uh, swarm they, they're both magnetic sensor missions, they're, they're measuring the Earth's magnetic fields. Um, and you can design a spacecraft which has an even much lower magnetic signature than solar orbiter. Has. Solar orbiter is exceptionally low, which you can get down two orders of magnitude below that if you're only designing for a spacecraft which has a low magnetic signature. Um, it's then difficult to design it to do anything else. So it's, it's really tailored for that one instrument. Where I find solar orbiters quite unique is at least certainly in my experience, it's, it's uh, one of the few spacecraft that you would design where you're trying to hit three, four, or possibly five uh, design constraints all at the same time. And some of them are conflicting, as I mentioned in the, in the presentation. So to actually disappear magnetically, electrostatically, electromagnetically, and, and from contamination point of view as well, I think is probably unique. Right. Well, thank you very much on that one. Uh, I have one more. Just trying to get back online again. I have one more question from Les. I'm hoping he's a. Uh... Yeah, I'm just trying to find it again. It always disappears off my screen. Just so I want to have a look. Ah, yes, this is the one where he says that's slightly off topic, but with the time, effort, and added cost to make the satellite contaminant-free and the extra effort from developers of planetary landers to make them biologically sterile as well. And with the knowledge we are gaining on how long bacteria can survive in the space environment, as an engineer, what do you make of SpaceX's plan to land their Starliner rocket on the moon and eventually Mars? Unless I've completely the wrong end of the stick, it's impossible to build it clean, only to have it stuck out in the open before launch. Yeah, so I have to admit, I'm not experienced at all in biological cleanliness. I know nothing about it, so I can't really say much on, on that topic. Uh, I'm also not much good at telling you anything about Starliner or, or, or launches in, in general. Um, certainly, Solar Orbiter was designed from a cleanliness point of view with only one objective in mind, and that was to satisfy the needs of the instrument. We need to keep those instruments ultra clean because they're operating at the edge of what's technologically possible for an instrument. Um, so that's generally orders of magnitude, three or four orders of magnitude cleaner than you would need to, I don't know, say, satisfy the cleanliness of having your hardware on the moon or on Mars. Um, I, I, don't, I don't talk about biological cleanliness, as I said, because I don't know anything about that. But um, it's it's exceptionally clean. If, if you know the ISO uh, clean, clean room grading, you would say solar orbiters trying to achieve 
something more like ISO 5 uh, than, than ISO 8. But um, your, your general outdoor environment, as, as the uh, question puts it quite correctly, when you're trying to launch a rocket, you're looking at something like ISO 11 or ISO 12. So you're, you're many, many, many orders of magnitude down. Um, I, I, I can't imagine the need to really want to build a launch vehicle for such high degrees of cleanliness because they don't have the same requirements from the instrument on board the launch. Right, well, thank you. Um, yes, now my, I, I would like to ask a question because um, an excellent and fascinating talk. Um, Solar Orbiter is much more complex and sophisticated spacecraft than I'd ever seen before. Uh, I'm more interested, though, in its orbits. And from your excellent animated orbit diagram, I was trying to work out the time length of each orbit around the sun. I calculated at about eight months to start with, but reducing to about six months or under in the 10 years. Is that about right? Yeah, that's right. So I'm back in my comfort zone again on mission analysis. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, the, the clever thing about the solar orbiter mission is that we use Venus flybys over and over and over again, seven times in total, although you never know, we might even go longer than 10 years and carry on. Um, so we're in, in what we call a resonance orbit with Venus. So to start with, um, after the first flyby of Venus, which as I mentioned is 27th of December this year, um, that puts us into a, a resonant orbit with Venus, which is one to one. So basically we have exactly the same period as Venus does, which means one orbit of Venus later, we will also do one orbit. and We'll meet Venus exactly back where it was uh, one orbit before, which is about eight months ago. Um, but on the second flyby of Venus, and we also then pass uh, do a flyby of Earth, but, but once we've got into that orbit, we go into what we call um, a 5 4 resonance orbit of Venus, which basically means we go around five times for every four orbits of Venus. So we basically have an orbit period of four fifths of the Venus orbit, which would then be you know, seven, six and a half months. Uh, and then later in the mission, we go to a, a four three resonance orbit. So we do four orbits of, for every three of Venus. We have an orbit period three quarters of that of Venus. And then finally, we end the mission with a three two resonance, which is we do three orbits for every two orbits of Venus. So we have an orbit period two thirds of that of Venus, which is about five months. So all your calculations, Alistair, were uh, quite correct. Oh, I should also say, by the way, that this uh, this trick of meeting Venus you know, every every few orbits has to be really precise. You know, we, you're making a rendezvous with a planet, uh, but you're doing 25, 30, 35 uh, mm -hmm. kilometers per second. And you want to be, you know, not quite meter perfect, but certainly kilometer perfect. So you have to be there within a few seconds uh, when you say you're going to be there, which means that you have to tune your orbit uh, continuously. You know, every few months you might do a small correction burn if you predict that you're going to arrive a minute or two early or a minute or too late, you have to take care of that. We have to be accurate to a few seconds. Well, thank you. That's fascinating. I um, I didn't know I'd ask such a complicated question, but never mind. Um, right. I always give complicated answers to simple questions. <laughs> um, right. I'm going to skip a couple of questions I was going to ask because we've got quite a queue of, of questions coming up. Um, Let's go straight on to a, a series of questions from Rodney Buckland. Um, they're a little bit um, difficult to understand and possibly answer, but I'll ask them to you anyhow and see what you have to say. The first one from Rodney Buckland, and Rodney's at the Open University. He says, the Solar Orbiter's mission, spacecraft and scientific instruments all have many and various interacting requirements for meeting their objectives. How has the design process handled this exceptional level of complexity? And has concurrent engineering played a strong role in allowing Solar Orbiter to be technically feasible and affordable to ESA? Okay, so, I mean, first of all, I left engineering about 12 to 15 years ago. Um, so I can't claim to be much of an engineer anymore. Uh, and I think concurrent engineering has probably arrived on the scene since I left engineering. So I don't, myself personally have any experience of concurrent engineering but i think i know what people mean when they talk about it so my understanding is concurrent engineering is trying to do engineering in parallel between subsystems so 
I think a good example for solar orbiter is the engineering that we do of the spacecraft in parallel with the engineering of the instrument, because they both have to arrive at the same time. Um, and also current, current engineering, I think, is to do with doing a design in parallel with trying to understand how you're going to integrate that design and how you're going to test that. So maybe if I come on to the first point first, um, we do exchange, for instance, a number of different models with the instrument teams while we're designing the spacecraft. So traditionally, we would have an interface specification that says we're going to have this power, this thermal interface, um, this, this location on the spacecraft, this bolt pattern, and so on. Um, but it's, it's more convenient uh, and quicker to exchange models mm -hmm. like uh, computer-based design models, for instance. So we routinely give the instrument teams reduced models of the spacecraft so that they can see precisely where they fit in a computer model. Um, which is, you know, really essential these days with the complexity of spacecraft designs, um, you know, lots of pipes, wires, uh, uh, thermal blankets, all sorts of bits and pieces that you probably don't see on a paper specification, but can have a, a really significant effect if you don't model them correctly inside your spacecraft. So, you know, a lot of that takes place, a lot of model exchange between the design team and the spacecraft and those of the instrument. And then I think something else that we have to maybe try and answer the second question is um, how do we know what we're designing is going to be testable or even buildable and so early in the phase of the design we build something which we call an electrical test bench um, people also refer to that as a flat sat so it's literally a satellite same as the design for flight but laid out flat on the bench um, and it's really very, very close to the actual spacecraft design, but, but done as early as you possibly can. And we build that uh, quickly, and we also use all the uh, subcontractor uh, electronic boxes and so on, and also the instrument electronic boxes. So we build uh, everything uh, as early as we possibly can, and then we start testing on it. And, and I mentioned as well the software for solar orbiter is as complex as the hardware. Uh, and that requires to go through a number of different iterations as well. Uh, and we start with an early iteration of the software, test that against this early development model of all of the different hardware elements, do a shakedown, make sure that it's testable, debug all the harness connections, um, while we're actually still developing the detailed design of the, of the final flight spacecraft. So we built this, or started to build this test bench in about 2012. Um, I think it was up and running in about 2014, just, just before I joined. Um, but the final design of the spacecraft wasn't frozen until uh, 2016. So for at least two years, we were testing, uh, preparing to test the spacecraft that we'd not yet finished designing. So we, we did take into account uh, as much as we could uh, the, the philosophy of concurrent engineering. So I hope that answers the question as, as much as I'm able. I'm not really an engineer anymore. Right. Well, just one second. I've got more emails coming in, so I'm trying to get those out of the way. But I've got another one from, if I can just read it out in a second. I've got another one from um, Rodney Buckland, and he says, have the exotic materials developed for Solar Orbiter helped make the space science pay? And have they found application in the non-space domain? Okay, so I mentioned some exotic materials in the presentation. Um, one of them was pyrolytic graphite, and there were a couple of others which were coating solar black and solar white. So let's start with pyrolytic graphite. Um, I, I'm not a, a technology historian, but uh, you know, a little internet search that I did a year or two ago said that this material was actually invented in the 60s by NASA. I mean, please correct me if, if I'm wrong, but this is quite an old technology actually. Um, and it's it's in many, many terrestrial applications. It's in uh, heart valves, for instance, it's in uh, nuclear control rod coatings, it's in heat sinks on electronic components, high power electronic components, it's uh, in rocket engines. So you find pyrolytic graphite really in many, many places where you want something that's extremely conductive but flexible. Um, so it wasn't developed for space, but Solar Orbiter did qualify it for the space environment. I'm not aware of any spacecraft having used pyrolytic graphite before, but 
again, please correct me if I'm wrong. So we, we've qualified the use of pyrolytic graphite in space, um, mm. which was challenging uh, because this material is, is brittle. And it's, it's very easy to fracture and, and, and it's not easy to demonstrate that such a brittle material can survive a launch. So we have to take special care of the material while we're doing it. Um, so that's pyrolytic graphite, been around a long time, you know, well distributed in many applications. The coatings themselves, though, it's solar black and solar white, which were developed by Enviro in, in Ireland, um, they were really the opposite end of the spectrum. Those were bespoke materials developed exclusively and specifically for solar orbiter only nine years ago. Um, of course, the technology behind that, uh, the mechanism for um, blasting uh, a coating onto a, a metal surface by first removing the oxide layer of the metal, um, that's already well developed terrestrial applications but this specific coating which i mentioned uses uh, crushed animal bones or calcium phosphate uh, bonded onto titanium that's that was developed only for solar orbit now that's that's gone on to have further uses in space craft so i believe it's on the juice mission um but i'm not aware of that having spun out into terrestrial applications as such so that's that's something i think will probably come very soon Right. Well, thank you for that. I should. There was a question on on um, on return and making space science pay. I should probably say something a bit about that. Okay. If I can. Um, so making space science pay might be a difficult one to try and answer. It, it's not only about spin out of of technologies developed for space. Um, I think, you know, the scientific return of the spacecraft itself is going to have you know, it, an enormous benefit for mankind, finally. Um, if we understand how the sun works, we understand how stars work in general. Most of the matter, at least the uh, visible matter, um, is in stars. So, so understanding stars, I think, is quite fundamental to, to pure science. Um, but again, I, I mentioned the operational system Lagrange, which is there to protect us from space weather, Carrington-type events. Um, so, you know, the, the whole benefit, the spin-off benefit of doing a solar orbit mission is, is not only about technology spin-off, it's also going to lead to hopefully operational systems for protection against space weather. Uh, and that's just going to have vast benefit for mankind over the next few decades. So I, I think, you know, making space science pay um, for solar orbiter, I think the case is already made. Right. Well, thank you for that. <clears throat> Just trying to get the next one up. Right, let's hear it. Actually, we've got another one from Rodney here. Let's get that one done. Um, this is another one from Rodney. He says, is the capability of solar orbiters scientific instruments to communicate and negotiate with each other, particularly when the spacecraft is out of touch with the Earth, an innovation? Has it been attempted before? Um, I'm not aware that it's been attempted before. We think it's the first time that payloads have communicated with each other. At least that's my understanding. Um, so yes, in that sense, it's an innovation. Um, they, they don't actually negotiate with each other. So they, they communicate with each other. They, they inform each other what they've seen. Um, and then it's up to the other payloads to do anything about it. They, they can ignore it or they can, they can themselves replan what they were planning to do. Uh, and it's it's quite simple, you know, eight times a second, each instrument just sends um, a few dozen bytes of data out on a, on a common data bus, uh, and the other instruments receive that eight times a second, and, and in those, those data fields are various bits of information that they can use to decide what to do. So it's, it's, it's quite straightforward, but, you know, the idea of connecting up all the instruments together on the same bus and them, them exchanging data between themselves, I think, is the Mm. Looks as if I'm getting I'm getting a bit of a, a mess here. Uh, let me just get the last questions out out of the emails because then I'll go on to the ones. Ah, oh, I've got a whole lot more coming in. Um, right. Well, I think that's that's Rodney's all answered. I think what I'd uh, oh no, I've got one actually that you might like to answer from Rodney. Have the inhabitants of Venusian upper cloud layers been informed of mankind's interference with the spin and rotational energy of their home planet 
through the multiple gravity assists taken by solar orbiter? Shouldn't we be empathic towards our neighbors? Okay, well, yes, we don't yet know if there are any inhabitants of the Venus cloudlet. Maybe we'll find out in December when we fly over Venus. Uh, but maybe Bebe, Bebe Colombo is about to fly over Venus on Thursday, by the way. So um, maybe Bebe will find out a little bit more about whether there's any inhabitants or not. But um, no, we, we felt we didn't need to negotiate with, with the Venus inhabitants because the change in velocity of, of Venus is, is astonishingly small. So basically, solar orbiter is exchanging momentum with, with Venus. Solar orbiter is, is 1,750 kilos. Venus is, I don't know, 10 to the 30 kilos, or 10, 10 to the enormous number of kilos. I didn't look it up. So the ratio between the two masses is, is absolutely phenomenal, which means when you work it out, the, the change in velocity of Venus as you fly past it, steal a little bit of its momentum is about 10 to the minus 26 meters per second, which is, is too small to even contemplate. I try to put it in real units. It's one nanometer over the lifetime of the universe. So it's not possible to detect it. Um, in fact, even the, 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 the stars, the nearby stars, have more of an effect on Venus than we do. So we felt we didn't need to tell them. <laughs> Send a message. Right. Well, I've got uh, four questions, actually, from Keith Burrell, who's a fellow of the British Interplanetary Society. Uh, they're all a bit technical, way outside my uh, my knowledge and, and experience. Right. First of all, regarding the magnetometer, as the orbiter gets closer to the sun and the magnetic field strength increases, does the instrument sensitivity become a problem and different scaling or ranges have to be selected at a cost of losing the resolution? Uh, I, I'm afraid I can't answer to how the magnetometer operates. Um, I, I think you're right. I think it has a scale of ranges. Um, so its sensitivity is really quite low. It's at the order of five picotesla. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the, the solar optic spacecraft itself is the order of seven nanotesla, so more or less a thousand times bigger than its sensitivity. It already has to effectively subtract off the, uh, the magnetic field of the spacecraft. Um, so yes, it's going to go through significantly different ranges of magnetic fields as it gets closer to the sun. And it's designed, I believe, um, to have you know, different ranges over which it operates and to switch between those ranges. But whether that affects the sensitivity or not, I, I really don't. I, I don't think so, but I don't. Right, well, thank you. Now, let's get on to the next one, which again, oh, it's another one from Keith. Let me just find it. Yes, here it is. Um, with the visits to Venus for planetary assist, will the orbiter gather data about the environment around Venus? And if so, when will this be released? Mm. Uh, it's, again, very topical question, because I think they're just thinking about doing that for Bepi. So as I said, Bepi's flying over Venus on Thursday, uh, and I think they are going to turn on some of their instruments to see if they can detect some of these inter interesting chemicals in the upper atmosphere, phosphine is it? Um, so I can imagine if they're ready to do that with Bepi at very short notice, then I'm sure they're thinking about doing something uh, like that with solar orbit as well. But I really couldn't tell you which instruments are capable of making such kind of detection. Um, and it's it's a little bit too early to, to know, um, but I can imagine it's possible. So it's, it's a good question. Right. Well, I think we've got another one here. Am I, are you hearing me all right? I'm wondering whether I'm getting, getting feedback from somewhere. Um, yes, now we've got another one from Keith here. He says, you stated that the orbiter has a conductive surface to resolve issues with static charges and minimize the effect on instrumentation. Does this not just resolve potential differences, i.e. PD, between spacecraft elements and surfaces, but leads to an overall static charge presence on the spacecraft, which just builds up and influences the surrounding space environment and instrumentation readings. How is the overall static charge on the orbiter dissipated or grounded? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, and the answer is you're perfectly right. 
the conductive surface on the spacecraft is only going to minimize difference in, in potential difference across the spacecraft. The actual charge with respect to the plasma that surrounds the spacecraft we, we think is, is, a, is a potential difference of the order of seven volts at the moment. So this is really quite low and, and it's not affecting um, or barely affecting the science that we want to detect, which is to measure electrons down to energies of one electron volt. Um, so we can see those low energy electrons in the electron sensor, which is at the end of the boom, it's called SWAR EAS. Um, and it can detect these low energy electrons without actually being perturbed by the spacecraft. So if, in a sense, we use the instruments to measure the, the actual charge of the spacecraft itself, and it, and it is low. What we wanted to avoid was parts of the spacecraft charging up to 30, 100 volts, uh, which is quite possible in small areas if they're perfectly isolated. Um, and then you would you know, potentially have electrostatic discharge between those areas and the, and the ones that are grounded. So the primary problem to solve was, was, yes, differences in potential difference between one part and another. But it's absolutely right. The spacecraft itself still has a, a potential difference with respect to the plasma in which it sits. But it actually turns out to be quite small. Right, I'm sure I'm back again. And we've got one final question from Keith. Um, Probably a rather difficult one, this one, but let's ask it anyhow. Um, the proximity to the sun and the potential of light pressure and solar wind forces acting on the asymmetric orbiter presumably affects the spacecraft attitude and therefore causes constant loading or bias on the gyro stabilization attitude control. And he then says, I refer to your you to the Planetary Society's Light Sail 2 mission and the lessons learnt of these external forces affecting the control of the spacecraft attitude, even at the distance of the Earth, Earth's orbit from the sun? Yeah, again, the question is perfectly correct. Um, the solar radiation pressure when you approach the sun at a distance of 0.2 AU is really strong. Um, and that is a strong perturbing force for solar orbiter. Solar orbiter is not actually that asymmetric. It's designed to be as symmetric as possible. Uh, of course, we've got the high gain antenna hanging off the bottom, which creates some asymmetry um, and, and the instrument boom to a small degree, although that's in shadow. Um, so, yes, um, solar radiation pressure causes us to um, spin the wheels up faster, basically. We're using reaction wheels to control the attitude to the spacecraft. As the radiation pressure builds up, then the disturbance torque builds up and the wheels start to build up with a higher and higher speed. Um, so the, the, the time between what we call wheel offloading maneuvers, we basically reduce all the angular momentum out of the wheels by firing thrusters. That, that gets smaller and smaller. So when you're further from the sun, it can be weeks. And when you're close to the sun, it can be as short as three or four days. Um, and, and what we want to avoid is that we're doing those wheel offloading maneuvers while we're also trying to take accurate pictures of the sun. So, you know, we, we, we try to if you like, move all wheel offloading maneuvers out of the science windows. But it actually turns out that, um, you know, from time to time, we do have to do a wheel offloading maneuver in the middle of a science window because the solar radiation pressure is so high. So, you know, the question is absolutely right. It is one of the design considerations we have to take into account. Right, now, um, I've got some more questions just arrived in. Let's hope we can find the answers to them because I don't think, uh, these have just come in from Alex Wood. Just find his email. Oh, he's got five questions. This is going to be interesting. You mentioned inter-instrument communication and automatic algorithms for detecting something interesting. What sort of interesting things are they looking for? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know. I mean, we provide the mechanism for them to exchange data. But we, in fact, they can even change what it is that they're looking for. You know, it's possible to reprogram things in orbit. So, you know, we don't follow in detail how they actually use the mechanism we've provided. Unfortunately, I'd, I'd love to give you an answer to that, but I, but I just don't know. Right. Well, I better ask all of these questions because Alex will be listening in now. Um, he says, can you comment on the differences between the heat shields of Solar Orbiter and Parker Solar Probe? Um, I, I don't know much about Parker Solar Probe. 
Um, what I do know is, you know, we're we're going to about 0.28 AU, which is 60 solar radii. Parker Solar Probe is going to finally nine solar radii. So much, much closer, you know, fact, factor of seven closer again than we are. Um, it's so close that, you know, they get up to temperatures of, we think around 1400 degrees centigrade. So at that temperature, you know, we can't use titanium foil anymore. Titanium is melting. So I believe the heat shield is made of carbon to survive those kind of temperatures um but i don't know much else about the design of parker probe i'm afraid now the temperatures of parker solar probe are quite high aren't they yeah as i said about 1400 degrees we think yeah. so i mean generally you know you can do a few simple sums just just to get a feel for those kind of temperatures mm. um you know the heat flow from the sun is decreasing inversely as the square of the distance from the sun um, but the temperature um, that you get, you, that it can re-radiate uh, uh, the heat flow that it's receiving, which is then proportional to the fourth power of the absolute temperature. So absolute temperature, I mean, with respect to absolute zero at minus 273 degrees centigrade. Right. So you can do a few quick sums. You know, if, if, if you're going to get um, half the distance, or sorry, a quarter of the distance, you're going to get to twice the absolute temperature. And when you when you crunch the numbers with Parker Solar Probe, you see that they're getting up to about 1400, 1500 degrees centigrade, roughly, you know, without doing any de detailed model. Okay, right. Well, I've got um, another question here again uh, from Alex. Uh, you said that Solar Orbiter could be out of contact for up to two months. Why is this duration uncertain? Um, well, the design uh, requirement is 80 days, in fact. So that's why I was probably switching between month, two months and 80 days and different numbers we designed to survive 80 days so so we have to design the software to design to stand uh, 80 days out of contact uh, in actual fact for this mission with this launch date the longest period i believe is 57 days or something i didn't check that um, but it's it's quite smaller than the maximum we could ever see um, so the maximum we could ever see is, is if we just happen to be um, on the far side uh, of the sun from the Earth, uh, behind the sun, uh, when we're moving at the absolute slowest, because we're at aphelia. Um, and we don't have that particular condition precisely for our launch date. So right now, for instance, we're at aphelia. As I mentioned earlier, we've done one complete orbit. So we're back to more or less the Earth's distance from the sun now. Um, but we happen to be on the far, almost on the far side of the Earth because the Earth's only gone eight months for the spacecraft to a complete orbit. So the Earth's are more or less on the opposite side that the spacecraft is, in fact, about 270 million kilometers away. And it's moving slowly there. So, but it's, but it's not quite behind the sun. So we're not out of contact yet. And it turns out these, these conditions, they don't happen very often. Um, there's one in... Uh, the first week of February next year, uh, but it's very short because at that point we're at perihelion, the spacecraft's moving very quickly. Um, so, you know, you're unlucky if you're going to have an out of contact period of the order of two months. Right, another one from Alex, and then I'll get on to the ones that have come online now. Uh, on the radiators, why is there a layer of solar black underneath the solar white? I think it's just a good way to bond the paint to the surface. So I don't know why solar white bonds to solar black so well, but it does. Um, it's difficult to paint paint materials directly onto metal surfaces, particularly if they've got an oxide layer. So it's a good way to clean the surface, um, but it's, it's it just happens to be a good good process to bond the paint directly onto a right. A it's final question. Layer. It uh, says, how much data can be stored on board before transmitting to Earth? And what percentage is transmitted? How do you choose what to send and what to drop? All good questions. I don't have the answer to <laughs> <laughs> Right. We, well, we, we have answered those questions in the past. Uh, and, of course, we've designed for it. So, I mean, just, just from memory, I know we transmit uh, up to 27 gigabits per day. Um, I can imagine we have to wait perhaps two months maximum. So you could think that we need to store 27 gigabits maybe for two months. Um, you know, we, we can do the sums. Um, 
it's it's you know probably the order of a terabit. But but I didn't work it out myself. But but yes, the space has been designed to handle that. Right. Good. Now let's. Oh, the other question was how do they decide what to send back? This is another very interesting question to which I don't know the answer, by the way. Uh, but the scientists do. They, they, this is one of their biggest concerns. You know, but how do they deselect some really interesting data in order to send some different data? And and how say if one instrument sees something fantastically interesting, they get all the bandwidth, and the other instruments get none. You know, this kind of negotiation and trade-offs um is it difficult even if you've got the scientists in a room able to talk to each other but if you leave the instruments to make those decisions by themselves i don't know how that works right well uh, let's uh, let's get on with the questions we're running out of time i think but let's let's carry on uh, can the oh this is from ramon hartop sancho can the solar orbiter assist in regular space weather predictions like soho and SDO do? Um, very possibly. I'm afraid I don't know what SOHO and SDO do do for space weather predictions, but I'm sure, you know, solar orbiters looking at the sun from a completely different vantage point than those two spacecraft. So anything that solar orbit can provide, I'm sure is useful information. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, we do have this issue that the data might take, you know, potentially up to two months to come back from space. Mm. Right. Well, here's one from, from Peter Robinson. Um, this one says, um, not all the components were thermally shielded. How hot will those parts, such as the high gain antenna, get when close to the sun? So the high gain antenna we coated in solar black as well. Um, that's also made of titanium. Um, and I believe that gets to similar temperatures as the heat shield, so over 500 degrees centigrade. The solar array is also sticking out in the breeze and getting hot, um, but we protect that by tilting it away from the sun. Um, and as such, we tend to not get much more than 300 degrees on the edges of the solar rays, which is uh, also important because um, the, the materials are, are generally made of glues, which, which start to despond above 300 degrees so we also have to protect the temperature of the solar array but we can limit that to about 300 degrees and the, and, and apart from the high gain antenna and the solar rays and the heat shield everything else is quite cool right okay i've got another one from uh, ramon hartop sancho and he says what would be the highest angle that this spacecraft be able to observe uh, observe from come 2030 yeah so it's about 33 or 34 degrees uh, and i believe that's effectively a maximum after a while you can't get any more gravitational kick out of venus because we're such an inclined orbit um that, that, that you run out of uh, you know when you look at the velocity vectors in plane uh, and, and out of plane at venus it can't give you any more kick once you get up to about 34 degrees so by 2030, we're pretty much at the maximum we'll ever reach. That's my understanding, anyway, of the, of the mission analysis. Mm. Um, so about 33 to 34 degrees, which is which is great. I mean, it's perfect vantage point to look down on the poles. Yep. Right. Thank you. Now I've got another one from Ramon Hartop Sancho again. He says, "Could in Connell?" foil be used as a multi-layer metal heat shield for a spacecraft getting closer than solo to the sun possibly i don't know much about Inconel. um i know it's an interesting material i don't know what temperature it melts at um very possibly we'd have to look into it right i'm just checking whether we've got any more no i don't think i've got any more uh messages with oh there's one in oh no it's from peter questions on crowdcast yeah, I think he's asked his question, unless you've got another one. Nope, that's probably it. Now, I don't know whether there are any more questions coming in. We seem to have expended our, our hours worth already. Um, but it's a question of whether you've got anything else you not, uh, you, you want to point point out or point people in the, next, the, the right direction. Uh, when do you start work on your next satellite? <laughs> Well, we haven't quite finished with solar orbiter yet, so I still have to close the contract. Um, the last thing we do is actually to send this electrical test bench that I mentioned earlier 
um, to our customer, the Darmstadt. Um, uh, we'll be doing that uh, in January or February next year. And then we have to close the contract. What comes next after that? I don't know. I'm helping out on a few other projects, but uh, I'm, I'm having a bit of a rest at the moment. No, I think it's it's great, and thank you very much for coming on board tonight. We've really thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, uh, a, a nice highlight to our birthday, and also a highlight to World Space Week. So um, next time I'll be more careful about selection of satellites and spacecraft. Um, Thanks uh, very much for inviting me, Alistair, and uh, I really appreciated all the wonderful questions. I love to get these kind of questions because... It's a great opportunity to go back and think, you know, actually, why did we do this? You know, sometimes you get too deep in the topic, you forget why you're doing it in the first place. So some wonderful questions. Thank you very much. Very illuminating. And it was a great pleasure. It, yeah, you probably learn lessons from each time you're asked a question like this. I better not do it that way next time. <laughs> yes, yeah, sounds familiar. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much to Elizabeth for setting it all up. But I'll remind everyone that our next talk is going to be on... Uh, well, in fact, we're going to get things ready by about the 21st of October, and we're going to have a, a Q&A session on, it's going to be Dawn Aerospace's space planes. And they're going to tell us about their program for developing their space planes. And uh, Jerome Vink is going to be speaking. He's one of the co-founders of uh, Dawn Aerospace. And he, on the 28th of October, is going to, suffer the same fate as Borean has now to actually listen out to some of the questions that you're going to put. So I look forward to getting your questions and I hope you're all going to watch his video, which is being filmed, I think, on Thursday and should be up on the website. Probably, I, I, we're going to put it back on YouTube again. So it should be should be there by the end of next week. So thank you very much for a great evening and thank you very much for staying with us throughout the hour. All the best to you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.